Tonight, Facebook's reckoning, life on universal basic income, and Blockbuster lives on in Alaska. We're kind of a, an odd duck here, and I like it that way. At least eight people are dead and close to a dozen injured after a terror attack this afternoon in downtown Manhattan. Police say the suspect mowed victims down with a truck as he drove along a crowded bike path for nearly a mile. Police shot the driver after he crashed into a school bus and stepped out of the truck wielding a pellet and a paintball gun. The suspect is injured and in custody. We ask all New Yorkers to live by the idea if you see something, say something, tell an officer immediately if you see anything unusual, anything that worries you. Be vigilant and know that there will be extensive additional employments of NYPD officers this evening and throughout the days ahead. Reporters asked President Trump today whether he'd consider pardoning his former campaign chairman, Paul Manafort. Are you going to pardon Manafort? Thank you. Thank you. The president didn't answer. Politically speaking, a pardon for Manafort would be explosive. Realistically speaking, it would be the status quo. Foreign influence peddling has been a fact of life in the capital for as long as the lobbying industry has existed. And while there is a law that governs the practice, almost nobody bothers to follow it. Alexandra Jaffe explains. The Mueller indictment alleged Manafort broke a law called the Foreign Agent Registration Act because he didn't disclose his work for an organization backed by a Ukrainian political party. FARA requires anyone doing PR and advocacy work for a foreign government or party to disclose it to the Justice Department. But prosecutions under FARA are rare. Manafort's case makes eight total since the 60s. Unprosecuted violations, on the other hand, Josh Rosenstein, a Democratic lawyer and an expert on FARA, told me those are probably everywhere. It's a very poorly kept secret that there are a large number of lobbyists representing foreign governments who have chosen not to register and are flying under the radar. Why don't they? Part of it could be pressure from the foreign governments. Foreign governments may not want to have the, uh, the eyes of the U.S. government or the U.S. public on their advocacy activities. Part of it could be that they don't want to open up their enterprise, their lobbying firm, to public scrutiny. Every document that you file under FARA is subject to public inspections. So a lot of these foreign principals and maybe even, uh, possibly even the U.S. lobbying firms just say either we don't want to comply with the compliance burden or we don't want anyone to know what we're doing. And for the most part, they get away with it. That's because FARA is pretty toothless. The DOJ's policy for FARA is to, quote, encourage voluntary compliance, which means they don't aggressively pursue prosecutions for violations. Listen to Republican Senator Chuck Grassley, who introduced a bill to fix FARA today, joking about how ineffective it is during a Senate judiciary hearing back in July. Only 400 foreign agents are currently registered. Does anyone here seriously think that only 400 people in the whole United States take foreign money for PR and lobbying work? But remember, FARA doesn't prevent lobbyists from working for foreign governments. It just requires they report it. Manafort's firm legally lobbied for dictators in Nigeria and then Zaire in the 90s, both of whom were accused of human rights abuses. And the firm disclosed it. So no matter what happens with the law, the status quo won't change. Lobbyists will keep taking millions from foreign governments to influence American opinion and policy. Tomorrow, Facebook will continue its congressional testimony and appear before the Senate Intelligence Committee to discuss the company's ad platform. 
the mostly automated behemoth that's brought Facebook more than $44 billion in revenue over the past two years, and that a pro-Kremlin troll farm exploited to purchase hate and lie-filled ads during the 2016 election. The idea that you know, fake news on Facebook influenced the, the election in any way, I think, is a, a pretty crazy idea. Initially, Zuckerberg and Facebook were dismissive that fake news and unregulated ads played any role in the 2016 election. But over time, their tone has changed. Things happened on our platform in this election that should not have happened, especially and very troubling foreign interference in a democratic election. I care deeply about the democratic process and protecting its integrity. Facebook's mission is all about giving people a voice and bringing people closer together. The Senate is focusing on Facebook's role in the election. But several people inside the company told Vice News they're concerned that the inquiry will dredge up something much deeper. A decade-long pattern of reckless product rollouts, embarrassing exposures, and denials that put profit first and Facebook's two billion users last. In 2007, Facebook released an ad product called Beacon. It would track you effectively on other websites that had partnered with Facebook. It would send information about your actions on these sites to Facebook, and then Facebook would post something to your feed about what you had been doing. When Beacon began, that process would happen automatically and not require users' consent. Users who bought movie tickets on Fandango would have the movie they saw posted to their timeline. One user had his surprise Christmas gift ruined when the ring he bought on Overstock.com was posted to his timeline and his wife saw it. There was an almost immediate backlash against Beacon, which prompted Facebook to assure users that they could opt out. Except as Stefan Berteau discovered, I was recording the network traffic that was going back and forth between my computer and these websites and Facebook. And I was a little bit concerned to find out that detailed information about my Facebook username, my email address, and the, exactly the, the actions I was taking on these websites was being sent to Facebook they explicitly claimed that they were not doing that, uh, which constitutes a lie to their user base, for which they later had to apologize. In 2009, Facebook agreed to pay $9.5 million to settle a class action suit brought by users. Beacon was the first sign that inside Facebook, user privacy was not a priority, even to those whose job it was to protect it. Unlike most of the other corporate privacy teams I had spoken to, they seemed very focused on how they could get us to stop calling them a threat, perhaps a bit more than how they might actually protect people's privacy. Two years after Beacon, Facebook announced a change to its privacy policy. Suddenly, a user's friends, gender, current city, and even profile photos became publicly available by default. This to us felt very much like a bait and switch. Mark Rotenberg leads the Electronic Privacy Information Center, or EPIC. Alarmed by the sudden privacy change, EPIC filed a 29-page complaint with the FTC. What we uncovered was the effort of Facebook to change those privacy settings to make user information uh, more widely available than they had intended. Doing a privacy change for 350 million users? Yeah. Is, is a really, you know, it's, it's not, a, it's not the type of thing that a lot of companies would do, you know, but, but I think that's just, we view that as a really important thing. But criticism over Facebook's ever-changing privacy okay. settings grew. Facebook's recent changes to its privacy policy run a serious risk of taking control of one's personal information away from the user. And the whole tenet of Facebook has been that you control your information. The FTC eventually sided with Epic, creating a consent order that required Facebook to get users' express consent before sharing their personal information. But Rotenberg says the FTC never enforced the order. It sends a message to the companies that even the regulators, even the consumer protection agencies, aren't going to act to protect the interests of consumers. And that can't be right. In 2011, Facebook released tag suggestions the facial recognition software allowed Facebook to tag users in shared photos automatically. Users were opted in by default. How can users make an informed decision if you don't actually tell them in their privacy settings that you're using facial recognition? 
This is a 2012 hearing on Facebook's use of facial recognition. And, uh, nowhere does it talk about facial recognition. Okay, page, right? Um, I, I, I haven't done I haven't done that, so I don't know that. that you haven't done that. So I mean, I, I've done that. I had I didn't create the the visual, so I. I don't know that, but I, I can tell you that... What, what haven't you done? I'm so, so I'm sorry, I, I just haven't seen the visual, so... Senator Franken tasked us with researching how private companies were using face recognition technology. Alvaro Bedoya was chief counsel for Minnesota Senator Al Franken. We realized that Facebook had created the world's largest commercial face recognition database without their permission. You can clear your browsing history, you can delete your cookies, and you can turn off your smartphone you cannot delete your face. Facebook is not collecting this information for benign purposes. Their goal is to be able to track everything we do, not just in our online world, but in person as well. Jay Edelson is leading a class action against the company in the United States, alleging Facebook violated Illinois' Biometric Information Privacy Act when it scanned users' pictures to create face templates without telling them. Facebook has filed a motion to dismiss the litigation. Illinois has the best law in the country when it comes to biometrics. It's a very simple law to uh, comply with. According to court filings, internal Facebook documents appear to show that Zuckerberg was frustrated with product delays and that, quote, we didn't identify privacy questions earlier. Once they realized that they weren't going to get out of the suit quickly, um, they hired uh, a bunch of lobbyists to come in and amend the bill, which would basically gut it. I think their goal was to not just gut it for the future, but to gut it retroactively, which would end up killing our lawsuit. If Facebook succeeds in gutting our nation's strongest biometric privacy law, they're going to open up a Pandora's box of privacy violations. It's that Illinois privacy law that keeps strangers from pointing a camera at you and using face recognition to identify you by name. Facebook declined to comment on this piece, but last Friday it announced plans to change the way it deals with political ads. Political advertisers will now have to verify their identity, and Facebook is building machine learning to help identify those who don't. This isn't a new process for Facebook. Facebook can regulate ads on its platform, and it does do so every day. Alcohol ads are heavily regulated in every country in the world. Facebook programmatically, by, by which I mean using code, goes through all of its ads, figures out which are probably for alcohol-related stuff, and then apply a set of rules that are particular to that country or you know that particular part of the market. And in a very similar way, they could do the same thing in the political sphere if, if they wanted to. Facebook has also promised to hire 250 additional employees to help, something it has previously been hesitant to do. When I ran the team, believe it or not, at the end of every quarter, the key graph that I had to show Cheryl was the number of ads being policed effectively, going up and to the right, right? We're, we're reviewing more and more ads, and the number of people employed in the team being flat. In other words, we're handling more capacity with the same number of people or fewer. So far, U.S. regulators have lagged behind their European counterparts in reining in tech companies. It's unclear if these hearings represent a new tack or the return of a familiar pattern. The moment you lift a finger to regulate a company like Facebook on Capitol Hill, you will be met by an army of lobbyists. And lobbying will continue to stop these efforts unless we as a whole decide to regulate these companies in a meaningful, common sense way. If I want to look you up or get information about you, I just go to the Facebook and type in your name and it brings me up like, hopefully all the information I'd care to know about you. Facebook began by giving away its product and preaching the gospel of sharing. 13 years later, it's one of the world's most profitable companies, with unprecedented powers of surveillance over its 2 billion users. That means that, at least for now, Facebook knows a lot more about the members of Congress who might regulate it than the members of Congress know about Facebook. This week, President Trump is expected to announce the next chair of the Federal Reserve. The Fed chair is one of his most powerful appointments. And so far, he's been using Twitter and Instagram to tease a big reveal. People are anxiously awaiting my decision as to who the next head of the Fed will be. But if Trump's approach has been unconventional, his actual choice is likely to be anything but. Trump has spent the better part of his first nine months in office promising to do the opposite of whatever Obama did. 
except when it comes to one of the most important appointments he'll make. Who's gonna run the Federal Reserve for the next four years? The head of the Fed is the single most powerful person in the US economy, even more powerful than the president. What Trump wants is a Fed chair who will use that power to do one thing, make the economy grow really fast so he can deliver on his lofty economic promises. Under our plan, the economy will average 3.5% growth and create a total of 25 million new jobs. The best way to do that is to make sure interest rates, which have been extremely low since the financial crisis, stay that way. What we do know is he likes low interest rates. And that speaks to his real estate background. He wants low financing costs. Maybe for him, it's just low rates are associated with healthy economic growth and he wants more of it. He wouldn't want someone there who would jack up interest rates just as soon as the economy starts to heat up. Trump's affinity for low interest rates is no secret. He's even called himself a low interest rate kind of guy, which is weird because presidents don't usually discuss monetary policy in public and because Republicans don't agree with him. Of course, everyone likes it when the economy grows, but low interest rates raise the risk of inflation and that usually freaks Republicans out. Not Trump though, he doesn't care about inflation. He just wants the economy to boom and a Fed chair who will keep interest rates low. The way to do that is to either rehire current Fed Chair Janet Yellen, who Obama appointed in 2014, or pick someone just like her. Right now, it looks like Trump is leaning toward choosing Jerome Powell, a Republican, but also someone who supported pretty much every decision the Fed has made under Yellen, which means the next four years of monetary policy are probably gonna look a lot like the last four. In Finland, 2,000 unemployed people are part of an experiment that could help shape the future of the West. For the next two years, the government will give them the equivalent of $660 a month for free, no strings attached. It's an idea called universal basic income, and it's got a lot of politicians and economists excited, and others worried about creating a society of freeloaders. Juha Jarvinen doesn't just play these shaman drums, he makes them. How much would you charge for this one, say, then? Uh, I think uh, three, four hundred. Not it's, Finland, uh, but no, internationally? No, no. Finnish people, they don't have money. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the only business he's got going. There's filmmaking and an artist's version of Airbnb. All this while helping bring up six kids. Sort of. All three kids sleep in this, these bunks? Uh, yeah, they are sleeping there, but uh, sometimes, uh, quite often, they are sleeping on the floor <laughs> or on the tr uh, trampoline. And, They're uh, sleeping on the trampoline? Uh, yes. I'm a bit anarchist and... Uh, and, and uh, are you a bit of an anarchist? Uh, yeah. Are you so, an anarchist dad? Uh, yes. <laughs> Had you swung by last year, things wouldn't have been half so jolly. Back then, jobless Juha was on dole money which comes with such tight restrictions, he wasn't able to pursue any of his business ideas. But since January, he's been getting $660 a month. No strings attached. What has a basic income made possible for you then? It's make a possibility to uh, create my own business. Before I needed to focus uh, for what employment office wants and now I can focus what I want to do. So I'm now like I am uh, taking control of my life. Before it was employment office and government. You get paid about $600 a month. What does that enable you to do? Is that a lot of money for you? In Finland, uh, there's uh, 560 euros. It's very little money. You need to be a magician to, uh, to survive with that money. So it, uh, it doesn't uh, make people just uh, chill out or uh, stay in their couches. His apparently idyllic lifestyle forms part of one of the biggest economic experiments of our time. Universal basic income has rocketed in popularity since the banking crash. Bernie Sanders backs it, so does tech titan Elon Musk. Now Finland is hosting the first big trial in Europe. 
This isn't the purest form of UBI, which would be handed out to everyone, even billionaires. Instead, it focuses only on the unemployed. Still, there's a big jump between pilot and policy, and ministers know it. What's the politics of actually giving people who are unemployed money just to sit at home? I think it's not about just to stay at home because I personally believe that um, in, in Finland citizens really want to work. Just as UBI freed Juha from being trapped on welfare, it could do the same for many others around the world. In labour markets and benefit system, is the long-term unemployed person takes a short-term job uh, he or she might lose some benefits and uh, you get more money rather stay at home than, than going to work. But of course I understand the criticism because it's um, very open-handed because you give the money and then you don't uh, tax them or then you don't ask what are you doing with the money. The link between work and wages is at the heart of capitalism. Breaking it is opposed by some very powerful groups. In Finland, that includes the finance ministry and the country's largest trade union. The problem is uh, how to fund the, the benefits. Uh, benefits have to be funded by taxation and uh, that's paid by, the, paid by the workers. If you pay everyone enough to live upon, that means that people don't have to work, which means that many people would quite rationally choose to work less. You are saying it's unaffordable. How unaffordable is it? What kind of impact would it have on the economy? Well, the current model being tested, if it were implemented on a national scale would increase the budget deficit by 5% of GDP. A more realistic scheme would, uh, would involve a much higher rate of taxation to fund, fund the benefits, and a high rate of taxation means lower incentives to work. What happens if we just give everyone money for nothing? Where's, where's all the tax going to come from to pay for it? There must be a lot of uh, like creative people and they would uh, create something new. After 10 years we have a lot of uh, new Facebooks, YouTubes, uh, uh, Uber taxis. So it's uh, like coded, I think, to our DNA that it's uh, all the time developing. So that makes people anyway active. If you live almost anywhere in the U.S., you couldn't be blamed for thinking that Blockbuster disappeared off the face of the earth. There are only 10 of them left in the entire country, but six of those are in one state, Alaska, where, for many residents who want to see a movie, you don't stream online, you make it a Blockbuster night. Are you a manager? Yes, I am. It's lovely to see that you guys are still in business. How is business? It is doing well. I have people who come into the parking lot just to take pictures of the building. People who come in and they'll walk around like, and you know that person hasn't been in a blockbuster in a long time. You can just tell because they'll also be like, oh my God can't believe you guys are still here. Why Alaska is Blockbuster doing so well and why we have so many? For one thing, Alaska is so spread out. You know, we don't have the, the, a lot of the capability that the lower 48 has, where they have streaming everywhere and unlimited data. A lot of these places in the outlining stores, you know, in, in Kenai and um, Soldatna and Homer, you know, they don't get unlimited data. And if you do get unlimited data, you're gonna pay an arm and a leg. Have a good one. Have a good one, Nick. Thank you, you too. This is where I've been coming literally since I was really little. The internet at our house and all that isn't fully functional. I don't 
have Netflix or anything like that, so this is how I watch new release movies. So we're looking at Thursday before 10 p.m. We don't have a lot of money to afford, like the, the cool Wi-Fi they got to be able to download stuff. And you know, for 49 cents, you can get a cool movie. It's nothing better than being able to go home to your wife, or your girlfriend, and be like, hey, I got a couple movies and some popcorn for $5.99. You know what I mean? You're finding everything okay? Yeah, I'm just looking for something else. They don't have my one and two. Of what, True Blood? Of True Blood. Alaska's an interesting breed itself. Let me go look it up for you. Cool, right that'd be awesome. The customers love to have something physically in their hands, and they want to read it. You want to just read this one? I heard good things about good that Good period one. piece. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm a little old school. I still have a VHS. I have the old school DVD players. We just barely got the Blu-ray, so to go online, I understand that there is a convenience to it, but there's something about, it's, it's the difference between having a book that you hold in your hand and an e-reader. You've got the real product here. We're home folks, you know, small town sort of America, I guess, even though most people don't think we're part of America. We're kind of a, an odd duck here, you know, and I like it that way. You know, I like the people that go, oh, why are you still here? Why are you still here? Because, you know, that's the way it is. We sell a lot of the T-shirts, the hoodies, water bottles, backpacks. In fact, I just sent out an order to New Jersey the week before that in North Carolina, Florida. People want membership cards. We send them out membership cards all the time. Yeah, granted, there's no blockbusters there, but it's still cool that it makes us feel like we're important. We have a lot of loyal customers that come in here for people who need their blockbuster fix. If this Blockbuster shuts down, um, it'd be kind of rough on me personally because I've been coming to Blockbuster for 25 years. But this one's still holding on. It's kind of that last 300 Spartan effect, you know what I mean? Give them nothing, but take from them everything! I hope they survive. That's Vice News Tonight for Tuesday, October 31st. 